Good morning, everyone. I hope you are fine. In our lecture today, we will discuss Chapter 3 in Weathering Heights, a novel by Emily Pronti. In this lecture of Weathering Heights by Emily Pronti, we will discuss the following. Number 1, the summary of the chapter. Number 2, the commentary of the chapter that includes the name of Catherine, the diary of Catherine, Heathcliff and Catherine, Gothic novel and the supernatural element, the supernatural element in Wuthering Heights, the Gothic and critical comments in Wuthering Heights, and the function of the supernatural in Wuthering Heights. Lastly, this chapter also will show vein of humor. And in spite of the overall terrified and mysterious atmosphere in this chapter. Well, the characters in chapter 3 will include Zilla, Lockwood, Heathcliff, the name of Catherine, Anshaw, Heathcliff, and Linton, Joseph, and the priest. Setting place, Wuthering Heights, time, still 1801. Now, moving on to the summary of Chapter 3. Chapter 3 is actually the last part of the exposition of the plot in Wuthering Heights. Also, it is in continuation with the previous chapter, Chapter 2. Because it is about the second visit of Lockwood to Wuthering Heights. And as we have said before, that because of the Dax attack, Lockwood obliged to spend his night at Wuthering Heights. And his night at Wuthering Heights is so important. It includes many events, situations, and also foreshadowings for the rest of the novel. So, it includes the chamber, Catherine's name, and Mildred books. So, as Zilla leads Lockwood to a chamber in which he allows no one to stay, Lockwood discovers a bed hidden behind panel and decides to spend the night there safe from Heathcliff. This chamber, however, is nothing but Catherine Earnshaw's chamber or Catherine Earnshaw's bedroom. By candlelight, Lockwood spots three names. This is the evidence. Catherine Anshaw, Catherine Heathcliff, and Catherine Linton, along with some other books. However, unable to fall asleep, he glances through the Muldood books. So, in one of the books, the Muldood books, Lockwood finds a caricature of Joseph and many diary type entries. The entries, however, reveal that Catherine is friendly with Heathcliff and that her brother Henley treats Heathcliff poorly. And after reading several entries, Lockwood falls asleep and has two nightmares. The first dream or nightmare includes a church and a sermon from a priest. 
and in this dream, Lockwood finds himself in a church in the company of Joseph, listening to a sermon from a priest. Suddenly, the priest points an accusing finger at Lockwood, and the members of the congregation begin to attack Lockwood from all sides. Lockwood hears the sound of the priest's loud tapping on the bars of the pulpit. But, on waking up, Lockwood finds the branch of a fir tree growing across to the window, striking against the glass pane. The second dream, however, includes Catherine Linton, that is to say Kathy, and a voice cries out, let me in, let me in. So, in the second dream, Lockwood finds his hand being held by a small, ice-cold hand of a child, speaking in a most melancholy voice and asking to be allowed to come in. The child gives her name as Catherine Linton. Lockwood, instead of showing any sympathy to the child, rubs the child's hand on the broken glass pane, so that the hand begins to bleed. Lockwood wakes up from this dream, yelling with terror, hearing his yell, Heathcliff comes into the room. With these two dreams, or nightmares, Lockwood awake. However, he declares that the room is haunted. And hearing this, Heathcliff has a response to Catherine's spirit. So, when Lockwood declares the room is haunted, he leaves the room. And he notices that Heathcliff is distraught by the mention of the name Catherine and is imploring the spirit to return. After that, Lockwood finishes the night in the back kitchen. As soon as it is dawn, he returns to the Grinch, and Heathcliff shows him the way home, and Lockwood arrives soaked and chilled to the Grinch. Well, now, I will start with the commentary of the chapter. First of all, the most important thing in chapter 3 is the name Catherine. So the name Catherine is mentioned for the first time, and it refers to both Catherine Ershaw, the older Catherine, and her daughter Catherine Linton, or Catherine. Also, it refers to Catherine. However, actually, the three last names associated with the name Catherine in chronological order, that is to say, Catherine Anshaw, Catherine Heathcliff, and Catherine Linson, mention the primary associations in Catherine Anshaw's life and maintaining symmetry in the text. When reading reverse order, they chronicle the life of Catherine. The second important point in this chapter is the diary of Catherine, because it gives important information about Hindley and Heathcliff. So. It refers to Hindley's mistreatment to Heathcliff. 
So in the diary entry about Hindley's treatment of Heathcliff, readers gain the first bit of insight into the enigmatic main character. Perhaps he is a product of his environment, rebelling against his tormentors. And this makes Heathcliff, the mysterious Heathcliff, as a victim. And from Kathleen's perspective, Handley is far worse a person than Heathcliff could ever be. Now, as the diary of Catherine shows Heathcliff as a victim to the reader, we have in chapter 3 the revelation of the characters Heathcliff and Catherine. So, throughout the novel, the primary characters, particularly Heathcliff and Catherine, tend to demonstrate two sides. And these revelations make it extremely difficult for readers to maintain a constant vision of them. In chapter 3, as I have just said, we encounter the revelation of the second side of Heathcliff. So in the first two chapters, Heathcliff seems to care about no one, yet, at the end of chapter 3, he is clearly tormented about the loss of Catherine. So clearly, the man who is initially presented as cold and heartless, has the ability to also be quite passionate. So far, there is another important thing in this chapter, which is the use of the supernatural element, that is to say, the use of the gothic. So we have gothic novel and the supernatural element. As we have previously said, the gothic novel is designed to both horrify and fascinate readers with scenes of passion and cruelty, supernatural elements, and a dark barbaric atmosphere. So the gothic element in Wuthering Heights could be found in two chapters, chapter 3 and chapter 34. And this element includes the gloomy weather, castles represented by Wuthering Heights and the Thrushgrass Grange, dreams represented by Lockwood's Two Nightmares, diaries represented by Catherine's diaries, and the ghosts represented by Catherine's ghost and at the end of the novel, Heathcliff's Ghost 2. Now, the supernatural element in Wuthering Heights in Chapter 3. An important question is determining the source of Heathcliff's passion. Is it Catherine? Or the act of revenge. Actually, here Pronti introduces the supernatural in this chapter, and readers need to determine if the ghost of Catherine has truly been walking the world 18 years, waiting for Heathcliff, or if she is an incredibly vivid product of Lockwood's imagination. So, the use of the supernatural element in chapter 3 in Wuthering Heights confuses the reader. 
It also adds the sense of mystery, suspense, fear, and curiosity to the readers. So the Gothic and Modern Heights, and specifically in Chapter 3, evokes an atmosphere of mystery and fear. So an atmosphere of mystery and fear pervades the whole of this chapter. A feeling of mystery is first created by the entry in a diary belonging to a woman called Catherine, whose name is seen by Lockwood, scratched on the wall in three different ways. Catherine Anshaw, Catherine Heathcliff, and Catherine Linton. The entries, however, in the diary are also mysterious from our point of view because we do not know the circumstances to which they refer. Hidden's treatment of Heathcliff on the other side gives rise to a feeling of fear and suspense in our minds, even though we do not know who these persons were. On the other hand, the Gothic is shaped around the dreadful dreams of Lockwood. So the atmosphere of mystery and terror is deepened by the two dreams of Lockwood. These dreams apparently have a simple significance, which however is not clear to us at this point in the story. The manner in which the congregation behaves is really awful. Every man's hand was against his neighbor. These words are indeed significant. The manner in which Lockwood wants the child's hand in his dream is even more dreadful. Also, the Gothic evokes the feeling of pity and suspense. So the feeling of pity or compassion is added in a view of Heathcliff's anguish and his appeal to Cathy to come in. Of course, we do not understand much of what is narrated in this chapter, but precisely for that reason, this chapter gives rise to a feeling of curiosity and suspense in our minds. Overall, the function of the Gothic and the supernatural element in Wuthering Heights could be as follows. Number one, they had been used in order to reveal the truth about the characters and the family in the past. So Lockwood's interaction with the ghost or the dream is also quite revealing. Number two, they put Lockwood inside the story by mixing him with other characters through the dream and the ghost of Catherine. So although many characters are said to be cruel to one another throughout Wuthering Heights, what he does, pulling the wrist on broken glass and rubbing into and Fro till the blood run down and soaks the bedclothes is as cruel an action to another as any other character in the text. Lastly and the most important is Lockwood's interaction with Catherine's spirit moves him from being an outside observer to an active participant in the plot. As we have previously said. Lockwood is the second narrator, 
because he didn't live with the main characters of the story. However, the story of this character has been told to him by the first narrator, Nelly, who lives with the main characters and the two families. Therefore, by the use of the supernatural element and the gothic, Bronte was able to move Lockwood from being an outside observer to an active participant in the plot through his interaction with Catherine's spirit. Chapter 3 also includes the of humor. In spite of the frightening atmosphere of the whole chapter. So at the end of the chapter, Lockwood says, My humor fixture and her satellites rushed to welcome me, exclaiming, To much justly. They had completely given me up. Everybody conjectured that I perished last night, and they were wondering how they must set about the search for my remains. So although the chapter as a whole is almost frightening, the last paragraph is written in a humorous vein. Lockwood tells us that when he got back to the Grange, the housekeeper there and others were very happy to receive him because his absence during the night had made them think that he had perished in the snowfall. That was the end of our lecture today. For further reading, please refer to the following resources. Next lecture, we will discuss Chapter 4 in Wuthering Heights. Thank you very much for your time and good luck.